Aloha no and mahalo for joining me for another conversation on Long Story Short. I'm Leslie Wilcox of PBS Hawaii. Robert Casimero is familiar to us in Hawaii as half of the Brothers Casimero, the award-winning and highly successful musical duo. He's well known. But how well do you know him? When he speaks publicly, it's almost always about an upcoming May Day concert, new recording, new DVD, a planned performance, or he's having a fundraiser for his all-male hula halau. Coming up next, we ask Robert to talk about the person, not public events. Part one of a delightful two-part conversation with Robert Casimero. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, produced with Sony Technology, is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in HD. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. The brothers Casimero, Robert and Roland, were leaders in the 1970s resurgence of Hawaiian music and culture. More than 30 years later, they continue to record and they perform locally on the mainland and abroad. Robert is also Kumu Hula of the all-male Halau Nakamale. I know you as a singer, a performer, and a Kumu Hula, but where did, where did all this start? Well, I don't know how far back you want to go, but I'll start with being born. Okay. Now, our, my, our parents, Roland and my parents, were um, music people. They were entertainers. So we, we fell into that immediately because it, we were surrounded by it. Do they perform in Waikiki? Yeah. Actually, not so much in Waikiki, although they did do that, mostly for the military clubs and for private parties. And they played um, the standards, the old... Um, mainland standards so we we learned to play that kind of music as well as Hawaiian music. What's an example of a mainland standard? Well you know do? like um, our love is here to stay for example and please release me and stuff like that so we would do that besides Kaneohe and Royal Hawaiian Hotel and so it started there and we thought everybody else did the same thing in all the houses that surrounded us there in Kalihi until you know we found out different and then went to high school and we got more involved with that I, in high school, I met my kumuhula, my Hiyayu Lake, and as she left the class that she had come to speak with, which was the class we were in, she told me, she says, you know, someday you're going to want to teach hula, and, and you know, you want to take hula, she said, and I'm going to be that teacher, and I was like... Did she know anything about you? No, I had just played the piano for her to sing the song that she had come to talk about, and so she, but no, she just told me that, and at the time, it didn't really register of, of the depth of, of what she had said, so... I said, okay, and then went to lunch, you know, sort of like today, actually. And, um, and then years later, I, I found myself at her door uh, of her school. So I went to the university. I took voice lessons when I was there. I would fight with my teacher every day. His name was Jerry Gordon, really nice guy. I kept saying to him, there are a lot of people who sing your style, but not enough people who sing my style. So I'll do what you want in class, and then I won't do what you want. What's your it. style? I think it's more, at the time, I thought it was more laid back, island, floaty, you know. Um, and, and what he wanted was something that was a bit more pronounced, more exact, um, full of, of a history of, of a faraway land. I mean, Italy, when you're from Kalihi, you don't think so much about Italy. You know, so. So it wasn't just how you sang, but what, what he wanted you to sing about. Yes, what he wanted me to sing about and how it was presented. You know, because when I sang Hawaiian music, it was much more laid back and, and uh, I would not say apologetic, but I mean, it was a step back. When, you, when I was taking voice lessons from him, it was definitely, you were out there, you know. So I was there with him for a few years and then I left school because well, our career started to take off with the Sunday Manoa first. And well, now, what happened to uh, the 60s and rock and roll? Were you, were you part of that? Of course. Yeah, yeah. Loved the rock and roll years. Yeah, I was definitely there. We, um, we thought that the platters were cool, and Roland was a real big fan of Jimi Hendrix, real big. And we got all into that. You know, I did, we didn't get so much into the drugs of it, as much as we did the music, oh. we really liked the music and the fact that, you know, we're the original flower people, so we were like out there. <laughs> we well, no, and, and I know that uh, people talk freely about how you, 
were instrumental in that Hawaiian Renaissance of music and language and mm -hmm. everything that came with it. You know, people do speak freely about the fact that we were there at the start of the Renaissance and leading the way. We had no idea. We had no idea we were leading the way, way to, for anybody or to anything. We were just there having a good time. We were just so happy to have people standing in line out there at Chuck Cellar in Waikiki, not to come for steaks, but to listen to us play music. You know, so we really had no time to think about this whole idea of the Renaissance until maybe like three, two or three years after we had already been in it, and someone brought it up and said, what was it like? And we are like, oh, uh, oh. You know, it was very interesting, and it was uh, fun. Well, when you would go out for gigs, did, I mean, did you enroll and think about, you know, your marketing plan and who, who your audience was and how to tailor your music, anything no, like that? No, We were just as wild on stage as we were, you know, at home, or doing what we were doing. Roland and I used to go to work in caftans and uh, get on stage and change, and then after on the breaks, we'd wear these caftans walking around the, uh, the, the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. <laughs> You know. They'd never uh, seen anything like that before. Well, no. I would wake up in the morning and cut my um, bedspread and throw it on and go to school at the university because it was the 60s and you were supposed to wear your bedspread to school or something like that. So, uh, yeah, it was never really planned out or strategically or, or any kind of game plan. Or but it was, it was just who you were. You were doing yeah, what, you, yeah. what you were. And we were still kind of deciding what we were and, and what we were doing, you know. Um, and then, and lots of experimentation in, in so many different facets, lots of experimentation. Did you do all kinds of music or did you do, do just Hawaiian? Well, at the time with the Sunday Manoa, we wanted to, we kind of like felt like we should stay in this niche of Hawaiian music, you know. But the influences of like uh, big things that were happening on the mainland became a part of what was uh, entwined with the Hawaiian music. Yeah. So. So Chuck Seller was your Sunday Manoa was, time. Yeah, was the very beginning when we became uh, known. Yeah. And uh, I was 19 years old at the time. Did you get all big-headed? No, because we were changing. You know, if you thought there we go again. Just to make sure you knew you weren't that important, we would change in the parking lot. There was no dressing room, you know, uh, and you still got $15 for the whole gig, you know, so, yeah. There, there was no way you, get, you could get big head. As the career got to be better and better, when pe some people would say, you know, you folks are getting to be so Waikiki, so mainland, you, you know, you're forgetting where you're coming from. Well, let me just say, there's no way you can ever, ever forget that you're from Kalihi. I don't care what you try to do in your life, you know. And after a while, it gets to the point where it's, it's, uh, it's a time that is so beautiful and so worth being a part of that you never, ever want to forget. You know, I, I'm proud that I'm a Kalihi guy. What part of Kalihi were you raised in? Uh, we would say Vaina. So it'd be like uh, uh, Camforth Road, where, you know, we were there before they built that monstrosity, the Quihio Park Terrace. So in the old days, from the roof of our house, or the back porch actually, you could see the fireworks at the Alamoana Shopping Center. Can anyone? Wow, amazing. Yeah, yeah. And you always lived in the same place as you were yep. growing up? Mm -hmm. And I finally moved out, um, gee, many, many years later, because our, our mom had Alzheimer's for something like 15 years. And I had come home one day and she had washed all my silk clothes in Clorox. And I knew that it was time to go. Mm. So I left and I never looked back. <laughs> <laughs> Roland still has the house. Both of the brothers Casimero, Robert and Roland, are masters of their craft and consummate performers. But you never mistake one for the other. Different lifestyles, different approaches. But as artists and businessmen, the same respect for each other. I really learned how to talk, to, to be comfortable in front of a crowd through Loyal Garner, watching her perform, uh, really too, at the Society of Seven, uh, as far as Flo is concerned, in a show, and uh, our friend Gramps, who was very influential, and my kumu, Mikey, watching them. Of course now there are the other influences, like uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash, and um, Kenny Rankin, who I would listen to for hours. I'd play his records, and I would listen to his style and try to mimic it. And if he was gonna hold it for these many measures, I was gonna hold it for that many measures and one more. 
Yeah. And you always thought you would go into music professionally? No, because getting back to this brother and sister thing, the brother above me, Rodney, was the one who was, we considered the voice in the family. So it was very difficult after he went into the service for me to start singing and then to have to sing in front of him. So uh, that, that was something we all had to learn about, how to handle uh, things like that. Because? Just the whole respect thing, that he was the older one and still is. And I still think that of all of us, he has the most beautiful voice. And how much does he sing now? Well, he's working on a new CD, my brother Rodney is, so, uh, and I'm, I'm very excited for it. Well, um, Roland seems like um, chaos. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's out there. That's a good way of putting it. You know, um, he's really reeled himself in uh, within the last uh, maybe 10 years. But you're right. He was out there to the max and over the top being Roland Casimiro. I mean, he, he was wild and woolly and the women were everywhere and the liquor and the drugs and the food. And that's making me sound like I was a prude. <laughs> And, and he would probably be late and you would be on time? Is that how it works? Oh, yeah. Oh, big fights about that, I tell you. And it was really some difficult times there. But he, yeah, he would, he had a tendency to come to work when he was ready to come to work. Yeah. How about musically? I, I sense there was incredible. There, there was not that any kind of schism about that. You know, the thing about Roland was that he would come with stuff because of his life the way it was. It would be so far off of what I thought was Hawaiian. But I liked it, you know, and so he would do stuff and I was like, okay, let's put that in. And he'd, mind you, another thing about that too is we had been with the Sunday Manoa and Peter Moon was the leader at the time. And Peter and Roland got along really well because as much as I was grounded in the Hawaiian thing, those two boys were out in the world and they liked other music and would bring it to the table. After we left Peter, um, then, then I had to listen a little bit more to Roland because he would be the orchestra. I was just going to be the voice, he was going to be the orchestra. And um, it, it worked out quite nicely, actually. Sure so, has, and yeah. uh, still going strong. Still going strong. And you know what, I can say now uh, that it's much more fun than it's ever been. I've learned to relax a lot because, you know, I was the one on pins and needles thinking that I had to, like, choke his neck to keep him sh to, to shut up so that I could do the show. And now it's just to a point where, like, it, it really, it sounds like such a cliche, but it's all really good when it's me and Roland, because we're just having a really good time, and it's, it's terrific. Let's talk about Roland and you for a okay. while. I mean, you, you've had this long career with him. Yes, very long. Uh, uh, it's a marriage. Long you know. and spectacular, and he's your brother. I mean, did you, did you folks grow up fighting with each other? All like, the time. Like most siblings do? Yeah, yeah, we, we fought all the time, but we got to a point, and I think, you know, we really started playing music professionally with our parents in the, well, I started in the latter part of the 60s, or middle 60s. Roland was already playing when he was eight years old. So when we went on our own, and by the time we got to like 1973 or 74, we had pretty much made up our minds that as much as this was show business, we were gonna concentrate more on the business part of it than the show. I mean, the show would come along. So we knew that pretty much no matter what happened, believe me, dear, a lot has happened that we would stick it out. I mean, it's not like we haven't had full-out fights on stage at the, um, at the Waikiki Shell on May Day. I mean, not throwing blows, because people could see that, but I mean, throwing words back and forth, and yeah. So it's, it's been a challenge, but it's been great all the way. Well, you two seem like such different personalities. I'm actually surprised that you are such an um, in, enduring and enduring Duo. I, I think because we uh, embrace two different worlds that we bring everybody in from those different worlds and, and meld them into the Brothers Casimero. Well, how do the dynamics of the two of you work? Well, okay, here it goes. I come, we come from a family of 12 kids, eight boys and four girls. And it was an understood thing as we were growing up that if our parents weren't there, the oldest child always was the one who we would listen to. I'm older than Roland by just one year. So... Were you the oldest? No, right? No, no, no. They're, I'm number 10 of the 12, so there are nine above me. Um, and so I would just tell them, and they'd have to listen. But you could only boss two other kids. Yeah, because if I said something and my older brother or older sister said something over me, 
I would say nothing after that. It was but just, you could boss Roland. But I could boss Roland, and I could boss my sister because she's the twin to Roland. So, although I wouldn't call it, Roland would call it bossing, <laughs> but I wouldn't. You're there in your nice Aloha shirt and and uh, long pants, and he's in green tights and a sweatshirt sometimes, <laughs> crossing his legs on the yes, stage. Yes, yes. It's just it's a, it's it's. So funny and so he, beautiful. He does wear some of those clothes, I, and I have to take credit for some of it because I did buy him a few of those things or get him into it at first. And as I grew out of them, he just got more and more into them, and uh, it causes a lot of trouble for me in other places. I'll tell you. But he knows who he is, and you know who he is, and yeah. you, you, and, you and understand each other. And so there's no other. problem there, you know. Um, and we'll make fun of it too. He'll make fun of it, and it's fine. I like him so much more now. And, and, and that's why we, we get along so one much One year difference. Yes, well, only one year. But I always felt like I was tons years different than he was, different as far as age. Did you always feel like you had to um, keep the, the duo together because, because you know, he was not disciplined? I, uh, I don't know that I felt that way because I knew we had already decided on the business part. So I knew that late or not or, or whatever indecision, we were still going to be together. But it didn't mean it didn't give me heartburn or heartbreak or, or whatever, because I was on pins and needles. How much does he surprise you on stage with his comments? Oh, I, I never really know what my brother's going to say. I, I never do. And sometimes I will say something that will trigger, and I know that it's triggering something in his mind, and I think to myself, you stupid. Stupid. Don't make eye contact. Yeah, right? Don't I shouldn't laugh. have said that. And sure enough, he picks it up and he goes. And I tell you, I, I can't say anything because the people are laughing so much and it's really so good. And I'm so pissed off, but it's so funny. <laughs> it works. Yeah. One time we were on stage at the Shell. It was Roland, myself, and Israel Kamaka Viva Ole. I was between the two of them. And they started on this thing together. And I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. All I know is that the audience was dying outside, and I just said one thing, Leslie. I said just one thing, and I don't remember what it was. Well, I was smashed down like a bug, and I was like, okay, I'm so staying out of this <laughs> one, man, because Roland and Israel together, they were amazing. They had a lot of fun and a lot of history. And that's part of the, the fun of entertaining, the, the, the interactions, and yeah. you feed off each other, yeah. right? I and mean, you become better than, you become Especially better than some of the parts. Especially when they're really good, talented people, you know? When you don't have to uh, say anything or explain anything. So if you like, it's like you and I talking right now, you know, I'll, use, I'll just say, okay, you take it, and then you say, you take it, and then we'll both talk together or finish each other's sentences. Happens all the time. That's why I said Roland, Roland and I have a, a relationship that is like, you know, we've been married longer than our parents were. I think, you know, so. You know how in Hawaii we tend to call people uncle or auntie as a sign of respect? Well, here's a tip. Don't do that to Robert. You're about to find out why. And Robert also explains the feeling he's had for some time, the one that drives him to sing every song like it's the last time. In terms of experience and achievement, although I don't know about in terms of age, you're a kupuna. Are you treated as such? Um, some people try. But you don't let them? <laughs> no, I don't. What do you Another tell thing them? I, don't, I just, Actually, you know what? I, I'm very lucky that way. Um, no one sees me as, as really being a kupuna. But, uh, and that's a good thing for you. That's a really that's a, good you know, thing. that is a mark of respect, too. Yeah, yeah. I just. I do have a rule though, and, and it's don't call me uncle, which is my email address, don't call me uncle. Unless we're actually related, and if we are related, you got to mention some names in the family line that I have to recognize, otherwise, just call me Robert, you know. And I've gone through the gamut of people calling me Bobby from when I was a kid, Bobby and Bob and... Neva Rego calls you Roberto, oh, well, and you yeah. don't to correct her, the oh, voice coach. Oh no, she can call me Roberto. To? for the rest of my life, that's fine. But the Bobby one makes me a little queasy. But it, then you know which part of my life they're from, you know. Do and you tell people, call me Robert? I mean, just yes, straight I out? I say, yeah. Hi, Uncle. No, just call me Robert. And you know, you know, for Hawaiians, that's a hard thing because part of the respect is that you call each other uncle or auntie by just telling them, look, don't. That's don't because you don't see yourself as uncle? Uh, is it, 
it's because you know when you're in the entertainment business, there is no no such thing as age. Once you get out of high school, we're all the same age. That's what I say. So don't call me uncle, and don't call me auntie either. <laughs> What's your middle name? My middle name is uh, Uluvehi Onapua Ikaviku Okalani. Which means? Which means the, uh, verdant, the abundance of flowers at the summit of the sky. And my mother was pregnant and she didn't know she was. And my, my aunt, my Auntie Mary Singh, from, who lived in Kalaupapa, that's a whole nother story. She called my mom and said, you know, you're, gonna, you're pregnant. And my mother said, no, I'm not. And she said, you're pregnant. And my mother said, no, I'm not. And she said, just listen to me. You're pregnant. And here's the name of the child. So she gave my mother my name. And she's calling you from the, she's calling from the Hanson's Disease Settlement yes. at Kalaupapa. Yes, she is. So my mother said, okay. But because of the, the flowers in the name, Onapua, she thought that um, I was going to be a girl. Well, anyway, so. Uh, but I got the name anyway. And so... Uh, yeah, sure enough, she was pregnant. She didn't know it, but she found out from my aunt. And I've had that name ever since. You think you live up to the name? Oh, I hope so. I hope so. Because the funny thing is, as I've graduated kids from my school to their own schools, they've taken parts of the name, and they have it in their school. My niece is my namesake, and she has the same name. And then one of my dancers asked if he could name his son after me. And I said, yeah, except take out the onapua, take the flowers part out. So this boy, Uluvehi Ikaveki Okalani, is one of, the, one of the newest members in Halau. Now he's dancing in school. That kind of stuff just blows my mind. I'm just so glad I'm seeing it all happen. You know, it's really cool. Sometimes you look back at your life and you go, wow, if, if only this hadn't happened, where would I be? Was yes. there any one of those moments for yeah. you? Would have been my seventh grade if I, if I didn't go to Kamehameha. That would have been very different. I think that, because if not, I would have gone to Farrington. And for all I know, I could have ended up being a drag queen. Just scary, you know, for me. Uh, another thing is um, that, you know, I, I constantly worry about my voice. And in December, I have a tendency to catch colds in December. So I, I try and be really careful about that. And um, one year, it got really bad, and I lost my voice, and we were doing three concerts with the Honolulu Symphony, and I did a concert every night without a voice. I talked my way through the whole thing, and thank God that the people were receptive, because it was one of the best concerts ever. So, and then I have to tell you about one other time. Roland and I were performing at the uh, Holiday Inn in San Francisco near the business, uh, business district, and we were doing the show, it was Christmas time, and the whole electricity within like about eight, 10 blocks went out. And management said, you know, we need to cancel the show. And the people said, no, don't cancel the show. So they brought out this flashlight, a real big one like this. And they stood in the back of the room and they put the flashlight on and we played the show. And we did a like, what would you call that? Like, yeah, well, unplugged mm -hmm. concert. It was one of the most beautiful shows in my life. It was just great. So, you know, glad we did something that at first we weren't going to do. And what do you see as the future of uh, your singing career? You know, it's, it's kind of uh, difficult for me to think of, of, of a future as far as I'm concerned, because I just made, uh, well, I'm telling everybody I'm 62, but I'm not. It's just that they say to me, well, you look really good for 62. <laughs> um, so that by the time I get there, they can say, well. But um, I, I don't see me being here that long on this earth for this life. Um, so what I really project, what I project is the fact that we just keep playing and doing the best in, in what we do. And if we can produce an album or a CD every year until the time of my demise, then I'll be totally happy. Okay, now you've just shaken me up. You, you see yourself as having an untimely or early death? Well, I thought, from when I was a kid, I always thought that I'd be dead by 21. I think it's a past life thing of mine. And the other thing was that if I stayed away from home longer than two months, that I would never return home. So that's why my trips have always been short and coming back in time. And then the longest one was maybe a little over two months when Roland and I went with Mikey to, uh, to Europe. But um, I always felt that after 21, 
all these years are real gifts for me, you know. Do, do you think you you live more fully every day because you have Absolutely. this thought that you might not have a lot of time? Absolutely. You know, when Roland and I were, I, I don't know that I've ever said this on, you know, for television or anything, but when Roland and I were playing with Peter Moore, and, this was before 1975, we were working at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, and we would get bomb threats in the room. And we would just be playing, and all of a sudden, all the lights would come on, and they would we'd have to have everybody taken out and we'd go out and the cops would come in or the bomb squad or wherever they were and they would check the whole room and then they would say, okay, it's okay. Now this would happen sometimes three times a week. Uh, so, but I tell you, if you were in the audience after that bomb scare had been nilled, you found yourself at one of the most amazing, amazing shows because we sang like it was the last time. So. Ever since then, I try, I do that now, that whenever I do sing or perform, I do it like it's my last time. Just in case, just in case. You know, I really enjoy getting to know people on this program, especially people I did already know, like Robert. He's got much more to share, including what it takes to get into his respected Halau Nakamale, why he expelled his much loved brother from the Halau, and his favorite music lyrics. Please join me and Robert Casimero for part two of a two-part long story short next week on PBS Hawaii. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho kako. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is produced in HD by PBS Hawaii with Sony Technology. High definition. It's in Sony's DNA. I gotta ask you one more thing. Okay. The local thing with the... Yeah. Can, can you tell me about that? We were at the uh, Ala Moana Hotel. In those days, we were upstairs at the summit, which is now called Ends, I think. And I was singing a song, and there was a man in the audience who was looking at me weird, and then he was doing, he's just looking at me, and so I said, I said, what? He says, you're singing the wrong words. And I was like, oh, okay then. He said, if you want, I'll teach it to you here by the elevator. So we just sat there, and he taught me the words. The next time I sing it, I'm downstairs at the, uh, we called it the cave at the time, the Kamaina room, and there's a woman in the audience, but this time she added that, she's going like that. And I was pissed off, so I said, what? And she's like, you're singing the wrong words. I said, no, I'm not. I learned this from a guy who lived in Kilkaha. And she said, my mother wrote the song. So I sat with her and I learned it. Again? Again. <laughs> <laughs>